I was born in 1978 to my mother, Linda Wake, and while I never knew my father, I've always wondered who he was. From the moment I came into this world, I was plagued by a rare condition that made me hypersensitive to light. And as a child, I was so afraid of the dark that my mother gifted me an old light switch she called, the clicker. She claimed that it was a gift from my father and had the power to banish the darkness, and it worked, for I was no longer scared of the dark, and the clicker became my most prized possession. As I grew older, I became friends with Barry Wheeler. We were always getting into trouble, and it was usually my fault. Barry was the one who always bailed us out, and despite our misadventures, we remained close throughout our lives. As a teenager, I discovered Stephen King's works, which sparked a desire within me to become a writer. Before I became a full-fledged writer, I took on odd jobs, one of which was as a night watchman. The job helped inspire my upcoming stories, and it was during this job that I met Alice. When I was only 18 years old, my first short story, Aaron Boy, was published in Dark Vision magazine. This story contained many motifs that would become staples of my writing, including absent or mysterious father figures and a battle between darkness and light. The lighthouse in that story would also hold a special significance for me later on. Unfortunately, two years later in 1998, I found myself in trouble with the law for public drunkenness and battery, and I was charged the following year in West Hollywood. Luckily, I managed to avoid jail time. After that incident, my friend Barry helped me land a job as a writer for the cult television series Night Springs. One of my first scripts was about a secret organization called the Federal Bureau of Night Springs investigating a parallel dimension. I wrote several episodes for the show, and it ultimately kicked off my larger writing career. Thanks to my success with Night Springs, I was able to write the first installment of the Alex Casey crime thriller novel series. Over the next seven years, I wrote five more Alex Casey books, all of which were bestsellers. Barry became my literary agent and helped me facilitate my success. Unfortunately, my cantankerous and sometimes violent personality often got me into trouble, especially with paparazzi. On January 13, 2006, I assaulted a man named Peter Villitson after he pushed his camera into my eye. Charges were filed, but I managed to avoid jail time for that incident. I also struggled with substance abuse, including heavy drinking. While I was busy with my career and my problems, Alice became a talented photographer. We got married and moved into an apartment in New York City. After the publication of the last book in the Alex Casey series, The Sudden Stop, I found myself facing a severe case of writer's block. I was unable to write a single word for years, and it took a toll on me. Alice, worried about my mental state, decided to take me on vacation to the quaint town of Bright Falls, Washington. She secretly hoped that the change of scenery would inspire me to write again. During our stay in Bright Falls, Alice also wanted me to meet with a therapist named Dr. Emil Hartman. She had read his book, The Creator's Dilemma, which dealt with troubled artists like me. Alice thought that meeting with Dr. Hartman might help me recover from my writer's block. I was reluctant to go at first, but Alice insisted, so we headed to Bright Falls, hoping for a fresh start. Little did we know that our stay in the small town would change our lives forever. As I made my way towards Bright Falls, a vivid nightmare plagued my mind. In the dream, I was fighting shadowy, possessed individuals, and a ghostly figure was teaching me how to use light to burn away the shadows on their bodies. When I arrived in Bright Falls with my wife Alice, we stopped at the Oh Dear Diner to collect the keys to our cabin from Carl Stuckey. But instead, a strange old woman gave me the keys and pointed us towards Bird Leg Cabin on Cauldron Lake. That night, Alice revealed the true reason for our trip by presenting me with a typewriter, causing me to become angry and storm off. But then, an unseen force took Alice and dragged her into the lake. I dove in after her but then blacked out. When I woke up a week later, I was in a crashed car miles away from the lake with no memory of how I got there or what happened to Alice. As I made my way back through the woods, I encountered monstrous possessed humans, including Stucky, the same ones from my dreams. I fought them off with light and found pages of a manuscript I had no recollection of writing called Departure. 
The manuscript described events that were coming true all around me. I eventually reached a gas station and contacted Sheriff Sarah Breaker, telling her about my wife's disappearance and the cabin on Cauldron Lake. But Sarah insisted that the cabin had been destroyed decades ago in an earthquake. I was shocked to see that it was indeed gone. Sarah then took me to the police station, where I received a call from a man named Mott, who claimed to have kidnapped Alice. He demanded that I give him the entire manuscript of departure in exchange for her safe return and arranged a meeting at Lover's Peak in Elderwood National Park. Barry, who had arrived in Bright Falls to find me, accompanied me to the park. We fought our way through the taken to find Mott, but he managed to escape with the manuscript. I returned to Barry to rescue him from the taken. The next morning, Rose Marigold, a waitress at the diner and a fan of mine, contacted Barry, claiming to have found the manuscript. We went to her trailer park, where she told us about the local history, including the fact that the cabin on Cauldron Lake was owned by a poet named Thomas Zane, who lost his lover Barbara Jagger when she drowned in the lake. A week later, an earthquake caused by the lake's volcanic activity sank the island, taking Zane with it. According to Barry, Cynthia Weaver, a local recluse, was the only person who knew about Zane's existence, and her articles were the only record of him. I met up with Barry to see Rose, but as soon as we arrived, it was clear that something was off. She was under the influence of the dark force, and before we knew it, she had knocked us both out. When we woke up hours later, the police had arrived at the trailer park, but we didn't have much time to process what was happening, as FBI agent Robert Nightingale confronted me. The man was unstable and drunk, and he was willing to kill me without mercy. Luckily, I managed to escape just as the Taken began to attack and kill the police officers. I made my way to Mirror Peak, where the kidnapper had said he'd be waiting for me, but as I arrived, I found Mott in despair, at the mercy of the Dark Force. It appeared before us in the form of the old woman from the diner. Mott revealed that he had never really had Alice, and that he had made up the whole kidnapping in order to get me to cooperate with his boss's wishes. Suddenly, we were both hurled off the edge of a cliff into the waters of Cauldron Lake. I lost consciousness, but just as I did, an unseen figure pulled me from the lake. When I woke up, I found myself in the Cauldron Lake Lodge under the care of Dr. Hartman. He claimed that I had suffered a psychotic breakdown as a result of Alice drowning in Cauldron Lake, but I didn't believe him. I cooperated anyway, just to prevent an incident. While I was at the lodge, I met Odin and Tor Anderson, former rock musicians who had past experience with the supernatural events in Bright Falls. They told me to travel to their farm, where they had hidden a clue to stopping the darkness. The lodge was then attacked by the Taken, giving me and Barry a chance to escape. Along the way, I discovered that Hartman was the one behind Mott's deception. He had used audio recordings of his discussions with Alice to fool me into thinking he had kidnapped her. Hartman's intent was to take advantage of the power in my writings, as he had been attempting to do with the other artists under his care for years. Finally, Barry and I arrived at the Anderson farm, where we found a record of their song, The Poet and the Muse. It seemed to indicate that Cynthia Weaver was the key to stopping the darkness. That night, under the influence of the Andersons' moonshine, which had been infused with water from Cauldron Lake, I experienced a vision of what happened during the missing week. Alice had been kidnapped by a supernatural force known as the Dark Presence, which had enticed me to write departure in order to bring her back. It was then that I realized the true power of Cauldron Lake. It possessed the power to turn works of art into reality, and by writing Departure, I had facilitated the Dark Presence's emergence into reality. The Dark Presence had done this once before with Zane in order to bring back Barbara Jagger, but the end result only saw Jagger return as a demonic shadow of her former self, controlled by the Presence. Zane had written himself out of existence to erase what he had done, taking the Dark Presence back beneath with him. It was a chilling revelation, but it also gave me hope that I could undo the damage that had been done. I realized the Dark Presence had deceived me, so I changed the story of departure. I wrote myself in as the protagonist and had Zane arrive at the cabin to help me escape, but in the present day. I was arrested by Robert Nightingale and taken to the Bright Falls Sheriff Station. That night, the Dark Presence attacked again, 
taking Nightingale and forcing me, Barry, and Sarah Breaker to flee. We headed to the Bright Falls Dam to find Cynthia Weaver, who revealed that Zane had given her the key to defeating the Dark Presence. Zane had written the clicker into the story to give me a fighting chance. I realized I alone had to stop the Dark Presence and save Alice, so I left Barry and Sarah behind and headed for Cauldron Lake. As I arrived and dove into the water, I found myself in the Dark Place, a surreal alternate dimension. Unlike my world, the Dark Place was subjective and conceptual, making it subject to manipulation by works of art, which then manifested in reality. I navigated the Dark Place with the aid of Zane, encountering a mysterious doppelganger of myself referred to as Mr. Scratch. Reaching the submerged cabin, I encountered Jagger and destroyed her using the clicker. But I realized the story demanded balance, so I began writing the ending of Departure, allowing Alice to escape from the Dark Place while trapping myself there indefinitely. Trapped in the Dark Place, I was pursued by the Taken, seemingly controlled by an insane version of myself. Zane appeared before me and explained the Dark Place's dreamlike nature, stating that I had become split into two facets of my existence. The insane Alan gave in to my doubts and fears, while the rational Alan attempted to restore control. I worked my way through the shifting landscape of the Dark Place, evading the chaos brought into existence by the insane Alan. Eventually, I found my way back to Bird Leg Cabin. Regaining control of my other self, I began work on a sequel to Departure, which would allow me to escape from the Dark Place. This novel was known as Return. As I continued writing Return, the Dark Place's power had been taking effect, resulting in the emergence of Mr. Scratch, my doppelganger. He was born from the rumors and conspiracies surrounding me, depicting me as a twisted and crazed serial killer. But, Mr. Scratch was nothing more than a manifestation of this twisted version of myself, brought to life and seeking to replace me. To stop him, I wrote myself into reality using an old Night Springs episode as a blueprint, transporting myself to the fictional town of Night Springs, Arizona, where Mr. Scratch had also appeared. I had to bring my manuscript to life to defeat him, using the power of the dark place to bring the town scenes to match those in return, thus altering reality itself. After much struggle and determination, I finally arrived at a drive-in theater where the ending of Return was supposed to exist. Unfortunately, I realized it was all a trap, and Mr. Scratch had created a time loop to prevent me from defeating him. I was forced to restart from the beginning, piecing together more clues about the final scene to make it accurate. This cycle repeated three times, but I finally managed to activate the ending. I discovered that the ending was not a real ending, but a movie created by Alice as a tribute to our relationship. This film destroyed Mr. Scratch, and depicted my reunion with Alice. It was finally over, and I was free from the grasp of the dark place and my twisted alter ego. The Federal Bureau of Control, a secret government agency responsible for investigating supernatural occurrences, sent its agents to Bright Falls right after the events of departure came to a close. They classified the incident as an altered world event, having dealt with similar incidents in Bright Falls back in the 1970s. The Bureau had no information about my whereabouts and assumed I might be dead. They found a coffee thermos in Bright Falls, categorized it as an altered item, and stored it at their headquarters, the oldest house, in New York. Fast forward nine years to August 2019, when the Bureau stumbled upon one of my manuscript pages inside the Oceanview Motel and Casino, a supernatural place connected to the oldest house. It was pushed under one of the unopenable doorways, marked with a spiral. Then, two months later in October 2019, the oldest house faced a brutal attack from an entity known as the Hiss, which possessed most of the Bureau's agents. Jesse Faden, the new director of the Bureau, discovered my manuscript page and the coffee thermos while she was searching for her younger brother, Dylan, inside the oldest house. As Jesse approached the manuscript page, an otherworldly apparition of me appeared, describing my maddening experiences in the dark place before vanishing into thin air. Some time later, Jesse sensed my presence again when she received a frantic message from me on the hotline, a supernatural object capable of communicating with extradimensional beings. 
In the messages, I spoke in prose, feverishly typing on my typewriter, describing Jesse's actions and thoughts in the third person. Following the rhythm of my prose, Jesse ventured into a new sector of the oldest house called the Investigation Sector, where she entered the Oceanview Motel and Casino. Through the slightly open spiral door, she caught a glimpse of me talking to a doppelganger of myself who claimed to be Thomas Zane, despite looking and sounding different. Zane explained that the version of him I had encountered before was merely a character he played in his previous film. He referred to himself as a filmmaker and shared that he had found a way to escape from the dark place through his writing. I expressed my concern about his double, but Zane dismissed these worries, leaving me confused and agitated. As Jessie continued exploring the investigation sector, she discovered more evidence linking Bright Falls and me. She learned that Emil Hartman had been captured by the FBC after being taken by the Dark Presence and was held in the investigation sector. Meanwhile, Alice, my wife, started experiencing terrifying encounters with a figure resembling me in our apartment. In 2017, the Bureau brought Alice to the investigation sector for an interview about these events. When Hartman sensed her presence, he broke out of confinement, prompting the FBC to evacuate the sector. Alice had already left by then. I shared these events with Jesse through my poetic messages. I also hinted at having a significant role in the Hiss invasion, mentioning that I wrote the Hiss incantation, a mantra chanted by the possessed, and that I needed a hero who would face a crisis. I used elements from my own life, including my city and my wife, to bring my story to life. The FBC discovered a Night Springs episode written by me, which described events similar to the Hiss invasion and even featured FBC director Zachariah Trench and head of research Dr. Casper Darling. Approaching the Bright Falls Altered World event area in the investigation sector, Jesse revisited the Oceanview Motel and Casino and found me inside the spiral room. After dealing with Hartman, Jesse received information from her subordinate, Frederick Langston, that an Altered World event had been detected in Bright Falls. Strangely, the alert indicated a date from several years in the future. Inside the motel, I took notice of this alarming revelation and remarked, It's happening again you have been warned.